influenced by him, who uh, have cut away even more of, of the ceremony aspects of practice. And Nishijima Sensei would be one of them, and Shunryu Suzuki, uh, who was also, I don't know if Shunryu Suzuki was a direct student, but he attended lectures from the Kodoso, of Kodoso Aki, and was obviously influenced, but he's another one who kind of eliminated a lot of that stuff. But certain things we keep, you know, even, even now we're keeping these prostrations and things, um, because in practical terms they work. You know, it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change out of this thing before dinner, but every time um, when we start a, uh, a, um, one of these retreats, I always start the retreat in the robes. Uh, and if I was a you know, hardier, stouter person, I'd probably be able to, to finish the whole retreat in the robes. But they're so unfamiliar for me as, as clothing, it's really difficult. But the robes actually have a kind of practical usefulness, which is, which is hard to define. Um, but they sort of, it's like a uniform of any kind, you know, you see a cop in a uniform and and it presents a sort of uh, a sense of authority uh, because here's this guy who's wearing clothes that look kind of stupid and are probably uncomfortable as I am now uh, and that, that sort of um, signifies a certain amount of, of committedness to to whatever you're doing, and that's that sort of sort of social function, and and all of the all of the things that are sort of um, left over from the, the ceremonial things, the things that Kodo Sawaki and his successors didn't get rid of, are are practical things, and and I think Buddha himself uh, was aware of that because uh, he also didn't get rid of um, the practical aspects of um, of religion. You know, this, this, this separation of what, what's religion and what's philosophy is, is interesting if you, because I was a history major, and if you go back in even Western history far enough, um, even in our own history, uh, these distinctions weren't so clear, you know. Uh, the, uh, you know, I guess the, the Greek philosophers were the first to sort of make a distinction between religion and philosophy, but up until that point, there wasn't such a distinction. But even even the distinction between philosophy and medicine and things like that, these weren't these weren't always clear. So, um, okay. I'm just wondering, like, um, as an analogy, like you're talking about, like a lot of useless thought. Is that kind of like when, let's say, you're studying for an exam or something, and you're mm -hmm. racking your brain for hours and hours trying to solve an equation, and you say, "To hell with it," and then you go take a shower or take a bath or something. And then the answer just pops yeah. up there. Or like, um, you're single and you're trying to pick up a girl. So you go to Rapongi and like you pick up all these books on how to pick up chicks. But yeah, you yeah. fail time and time again. It's finally you say to hell with it. Go to a cafe, you just settle down. And then you happen to chat with the girl next to you yeah. and it happens to become your wife. Yeah. So it's just that kind of like, the harder you try, sometimes the harder, you, the more you're going to fail until you just be yourself. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's definitely, that's definitely the case. I mean, that's, that's sort of a normal thing in, in, in human life. I mean, as a, um, I haven't written songs for a long time, but I used to uh, write a lot of them. I made a lot of, made a, not a lot, I made six records. Um, but, uh, and I was the main songwriter for the band, so uh, that, was, that was something that came up in my own experience, uh, which is kind of what I always relate it to, uh, is, you know, if I tried to write a song, it, it never happened. Or you know, I could I could sit down there and put something together, just because I knew how to do it. Um, but it would suck, you know. Uh, and the only thing that, that ever came out um, that was any good were things that just came completely unbidden. You know, uh, this is why you know this is why sometimes musicians become religious because they think well. You know, be God, you know, or some, something, because it's certainly not me. Uh, things just sort of um, percolate up. When you're doing your zaza in practice, a lot of stuff will percolate up from your subconscious, so uh, just sort of get in a side light from what I was saying there. Um, and, and sometimes you'll get um, something that seems to be a, a, a great thought or a great um, realization or so on but uh, if when you're doing the practice usually they'll 
your teacher will tell you if you bring your great realization to him, they'll, they'll tell you to, to drop it, to forget about it. Um, and that's also part of the practice as well. Just, uh, just whatever comes up, you just kind of leave it aside, no matter how uh, great it may seem to be. And that's, that's tough. When did you want to start doing that uh, instruction about dinner? Do I need to stop early, or do we need to keep, keep going all the way? Five. Oh, from five. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. As far as religious things are concerned, uh, I've had people who get kind of um, have difficulty with the chanting that we do, and in response to that, I gave up the chanting before, uh, you know, the chanting before and after lectures for a short time when I was doing the lectures in in Tokyo, um, and I found that it was difficult to have a really serious Buddhist lecture without doing this chant at the beginning and end, which is which is kind of weird. This is my own. Um, my own personal sense of it. Uh, it sort of forces you to be serious if you've said, you know, even if we live for countless eons, we'll never meet the truth, and etc., uh, etc. Et and then, once you've said that, it's difficult to, you know, just sit around chatting <laughs> afterwards. You, get, you feel like you have to say something <coughs> important, or at least make an effort to. Oh, related to chanting, what is the value of using the original old um, Japanese that's directed from Chinese kanji that nobody understands anymore yeah. rather than just using English? If you have a predominantly English speaking group. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I th I've, I've gone to, because uh, I've been getting invited to places, and most of the places I end up going to in the U.S. when I go to a Buddhist center, they do the chanting in English. It's kind of standard. Um, and what, uh, when I ask about it, what it usually turn out to be is some Japanese teacher has gone to America and translated the, the stuff into English and they chant it. Um, but I went to this place, that, some of you have heard this, this story before, so forgive me, but um, I went to, to the Milwaukee Zen Center and there was a very nice place, a uh, very nice teacher there, but it just... To me, it sounded a bit comical when they did this because they would try to do in the in the Japanese. There's a there's kind of a falling cadence at the end of end of some of the chants, and and I remember just just one of the chants they translated when they did it in English went. I forget the rest of it, but it ended up and thus we bow to Buddha, and I just thought that was so funny here, Buddha. Um, <laughs> I don't. Know. It just I don't know, made me think of Jackie Gleason for some reason, but, uh, but I don't know why. Um, so uh, to to me, the, when I do the stuff in Santa Monica, I do the the stuff in Japanese, cause cause I basically learned it in Japan. My first teacher Tim, <coughs> um, he didn't do these these chants. He did a few, but he would usually do them in Japanese, because also he learned from a Japanese teacher and the, the rhythm. The rhythm works better in that language. But I don't think there's any special value to doing it in Japanese. Um, it, just, it just sounds better. Um, and my own take on it is, is, since we got the translations anyway, so you can read it and know what you're saying, so you know you're not like pledging your soul to Satan or something <laughs> as, as you read these. Um, then you might as well do it in a way that sounds good. Um, but as far as any sort of magical significance to the words themselves, I don't know. My, my own feeling is that, that just that sounding good sets the tone for discussion, like you mentioned. Mm. And I wondered if maybe well, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that sort of rhythmic chanting uh, kind of has a, an effect. Um, and it's difficult to define exactly what that effect is, but it, it works. It's practical. I think that, that uh, maybe these two things are all kind of interconnected insofar as, like like you said, it doesn't really matter where you do Zazen, just as, as long as you do it. Like, yeah. you don't really need to come to a really old temple like this and do Zazen. You can do it in your, your bedroom. Um, 